Welcome back to the second segment of this law session in English legal system looking at juries. Now, before the break, uh, I flagged up that the way we know the jury today is not necessarily how it was before. Indeed, we're going to have a look at the period between, say, the late 17th right up to, to say, the early 19th century. But before we do that, I just want to say this, that when you look at the requirement to have been a juror before, it used to be that property was very important. And it's not just any property either. It was property set at a rateable value, which meant that at one point, when you look at who uh, could become jurors, based on the persons on the electoral roll, there was about 78% of persons generally who did not qualify to become jurors. But when you looked at women, about 95% of them weren't uh, eligible to be jurors. So the point is that the whole uh, qualification and eligibility has evolved tremendously as it relates just to uh, to that era to be eligible to be a juror but even what they do has changed remarkably and so what i want us to consider for a moment is looking at the juror uh over a period as i say um when you look at uh, the conduct of criminal trials in the late 17th uh 18th and early 19th centuries we have seen that there has been research to give us some idea as to how juries functioned. Now, John Langbean, who is from the University of Chicago, uh, had developed a picture of the criminal trial from the reports in the Old Bailey Session papers for the period 1670 to 1730. And of course, this is in his book in 1983. Might be an idea to look at it, but certainly for what you have at the moment in any text, cases, and materials, you can find this. Now, he published uh, the accounts of the trials uh, which uh, provide data on how the trials operated. Now, the Old Bailey sat eight times a year and a sessions paper was produced for each session. Now, session papers are obviously not an ideal source of information, but what they do show is an interesting picture of the trials which operated in a manner which largely contrast to what we have today of proper procedure. Now, what Langbean has been able to glean uh, from the Old Bailey papers are these. First, there was a single jury who was empaneled to hear a large number of cases. So typically, there were only two 12-man juries for the entire session. So uh, you'd have a London jury and a Middlesex jury. The session lasted several days and processed somewhere in the order of 50 to 100 felony cases. Now, in December 1678, for example, there was a two-day session, and between them, the two juries returned verdicts in cases involving no less than 36 accused over those two days. So effectively, what you're seeing here are professional jurors in action. Now, a mid-18th century assizes judge would preside over felony trials in a day or so than uh, the amount of cases he would see in a day would be more than a judge today would see in a year. Now, there are various factors which explain this rapid turnover, Langbean says. He says, when you look at the schedule of trial, the scheduling of trials, the scheduling was close to the happening of the crime. So it's not like now we're six months down the road, somebody's bailed and he comes back and he's bailed again. The trial and the crime was pretty much in close succession, sometimes within a few days. Now what you have was prompt pre-trial evidence gathering and shift and basically you could shift this uh, kind of cases uh, pretty quickly and this was done by the justice of the peace. Now the virtual absence of lawyers also accounted for uh, the speed uh, largely because what you will see is by the time the lawyers come on board it is not moving as quickly. Now there was also a sort of informality and a sort of conversational informality about the cases. There was the constant resort to the accused as a testimonial source. He, he was the one who is involved in this. He should be the one uh, giving evidence, as it were. And what you will find is that 
you did not have this uh, silence being resorted to uh, as it is nowadays. So when you look at the recurrent use of jurors who are long experienced in jury work, frankly, it was almost like the magistrates of today's. But what you had was a panel of jurors of 12 men, as it usually would have been, and uh, what you'd have were experienced jurors, men who needed relatively little formal instructions on the essentials of the criminal law and procedure. They've been doing this. They know what the law and procedure is. And so they didn't really need uh, very much guidance. And so when you look at what the guidance they received from the judge, not much at all. And the judge exercised a somewhat unrestricted power to comment on the merits of the case. That's what Langbein said anyway from his research. Now it was common for the cases to be tried and decided in batches. The jury would hear a number of trials and then they would go off and deliberate on all the cases together. Now, when you look at the assizes in December 1678, for instance, the Middlesex jury dealt with 21 cases, but they deliberated only three times. The first batch they considered consisted of seven cases, the second batch, eight cases, the last batch, six cases. So basically, they were hearing the cases back to back, then they would go off and make a decision in each of, each of the cases. Now, it certainly appeared efficient, now, whether or not it was fear uh, in the context of, say, me looking back, maybe not. But it did have an air of efficiency about it. Now, the jurors were usually veterans of earlier sessions. It appeared that the jurors were selected from a very small group. This was due in no small part, of course, to the property qualification. And trials took place at amazing speed. So, if it's the speed you want, consider the argument today to do away with jurors because we see that you had jurors where the speed was pretty quick. Now, in most cases, uh, they were, of course, not guilty pleas, but they were disposed of in pretty short order. And typically, a jury would hear about 12 to 20 cases in a day. Now, the accused made no plea or offered no evidence or he would only bring character witnesses along. And one reason for the striking speed of events was that trials tended to take place, as I say, within a very short time of the event occurring. Now, the committal procedure often resulted in the accused making a statement or confession, and the not guilty plea that then followed was more or less a pro forma than being the real thing. Now, the prosecution was at least allowed to have a barrister, whereas the defense was not. The trial looked very different from today because without lawyers, of course, you had no opening speech, you had no closing speech, there was no examination or cross, uh, and so there was no motion or points of evidence. So here's a question for you. Is it that the jurors are not the problem, rather it is the lawyers and the introduction? Because without them, it certainly appeared to have gone quicker. So how did the rules of evidence came out? Well, question of witnesses was done by the judges, by the judge himself or by the accused. Now, the accused could not give sworn evidence, but he could both question prosecution witnesses and call and question defense witnesses. He would be asked by the judge what reply he made to prosecution evidence, and it was normal for him to respond rather than to rely on any right of silence or right not to incriminate himself. And it's interesting, in Langbein's, uh, uh, when he did this research, Langbein says that in the entire 60-year period from the 1670s that he covered, he did not come across a single case in which an accused person refused to speak in reliance on the right of silence. And it wasn't that it wasn't there before, it's just persons actually went ahead and basically gave their story. Also, he said, the judge gave few instructions to the jury about each case. Jury deliberations were often perfunctionary. Sometimes the jury did not even retire to reach a verdict. What you get then is the jury listen, listening, and then coming to a decision. Now, the judge played a far more dis, uh, direct role. He got more involved uh, than what you would see today. So then, you had a situation where the judge basically 
uh, was uh, the one who would direct and say what he what he wanted and directed the jury as to what he wanted them to say. Now, although we see Bushell's case in 1670 establishes the principle, and it is a case for you to look at, because in Bushell's case, we see the judge saying to the jury, go back and find another, uh, make another decision. Go back, and they kept putting them uh, basically in prison and, and, and saying to them, we will not uh, hear anything unless, of course, you come back with the answer that we want. Now, although Bushell's case had established the principle that jurors could not be fined for returning a verdict which was contrary to the trial judge's instructions, which is what had happened, Bushell's was not uh, typical. Because what uh, has been gleaned from the Old Bailey Session papers was that judge normally exercise so much influence over the jury that Langbean suggests that it is difficult to characterize the jury as functioning autonomously. So when you look at Bushell's case, we see that the juror was very intransigent. They kept saying, no, this is what we found. The, the judge was saying to them, well, you have to find him uh, guilty or find them guilty. What we get is that you have the jurors in that case not wanting to follow. But what Langbean said was that when, that was not typical. Normally, it was as if the jury did not function autonomously. The judge often was the one who would, uh, for example, do the examination in chief of both the witnesses and the accused, uh, as well as in the summing up to the jury. He exercised what seemed to have been a wholly unrestricted power to comment on the merits of the case. So what we get is that you get this idea of uh, basically the judge running the show, more or less. He's the one who's in charge. He's the one who is telling the jury what to do and exactly how to do it. So when you consider the period uh, up to then, uh, the judge was the predominant force, certainly not the jury, because uh, they could be told, as I say, how they're supposed to find in any particular case, even if uh, they were looking at it from a completely uh, different standpoint. It is, uh, Langbean said, that the jury did not have that kind of independence and autonomy that it does today based on the research. Now then, we see the arrival of lawyers. Now, the rule that the accused could not have a lawyer started to break down in the 1730s. We then, of course, have defense counsel coming on board. We see that um, the lawyers then would be able to to, to, to assist, uh, the even though before they were allowed for misdemeanors, they weren't for felonies. But what we get now is that you get this input of the lawyers who begin to play a role in the examination process, being able to ask questions, uh, examination in chief, and cross-examinations, and so on. So the input of the lawyers, of course, meant that the timing that it was taking was certainly a lot more. Jurors, therefore, seem to have gotten more independent. This was this developing situation, and what we see is that the jurors took on uh, a sort of independence uh, as was for example exhibited in Bushell's case itself. Now the point though is that kind of independence does not necessarily mean that uh, we are at the point where the jury is uh, sacrosanct. We will see of course later on that that is not the case. We see where uh, there's been on some sort of an onslaught on the jury. We've seen cases uh, being heard without a jury, and so it is something to consider. Now, what I want us to, of course, look at is the modern day and looking at the role that the jury has played within the English legal system. I want us to take a short break now, and when we come back, I want us to now consider, since the Juries Act of 1974, what is the position, and certainly what is the current position as it relates to where the jury is looking to go. We'll take a short break. <laughs> 